Now, my man has a really long history with American Society for Cybernetics. I have to look at the date here. It's in 2008, he got the Wiener Medal, really a gold medal from us, which is long overdue, of course. Umberto, can I invite you up? Thank you very much. I am pleased that you have applauded your expectations, <laughs> but expectations are never fulfilled. And so you are free to listen to whatever you listen, and I'm free to say whatever I'm going to say, because expectations will not be satisfied. We founded the this uh, institute in which we were concerned with the purpose of understanding how come that we human beings care for other human beings. And this is the background question. The word matristic has a double meaning. It comes from matrix, the network of relations, and matrix, the uterus. So it's a reference to the matrix of human existence that contains us in its own complexity and the human life, and we, we shall say a little bit about that perhaps in some moment, is from its beginning an inter lacing of biology and culture, so we say it's biological culture matrix. And it is this biological culture matrix in which we realize ourselves and we realize it with our living human beings. But now I would like to, to say something about Einstein. It was how do we know? and he generated special relativity and general relativity. And what he did was a very simple thing, was to follow the consequences of showing on what grounds he claimed what he claimed. As a young man, as a boy perhaps, he liked to swim and he had the question of when I am on that pebble on the ground, it is thinking in the same, at the same time, in the same vertical line. How do you know that? And his whole story is an answering that question about simultaneity and how do you, how do you claim that two events are simultaneous? And now, we want to reflect on how do we know that we know? Well, the answer is, I, we call it fundamental relativity. And what we shall do is something similar to what Einstein did, which is to follow the consequences of accepting certain <coughs> basic notions or conditions which are unavoidable, which are part of our existence. We are living beings, and living happens to us. We don't do it. If you are living, and you are not making it, and it's happening to you. If you were to try to make your living, you would not be able to. You would be perhaps trapped in the incapacity of conflicting desires of what to do in any moment. So wonderful it happens to us. Whatever we do, Whatever we think, whatever we imagine, of course, as a, a future feature of the realization of our living. We die, everything ends. I mean, we who have not fallen dead can say, oh, what shall, shall we do with the corpse? But uh, whatever this person was doing, and how do we do what we do? This is our theme.
not reality, is not the essence, the being, is how do we do what we do. And this, there are certain fundamental operations and concepts that we have to respect. I mean, we cannot but be respecting them because <laughs> this occurs. No? And I shall call one of them structural determinism. We find ourselves living as we ask ourselves about what is to live. We are in the fundamental inertia. We do not distinguish in the experience between perception and illusion. And these are the four basic not premises, conditions of existence. Hmm? Structural determinism. And this is our fundamental conscious and unconscious being, doing. We are in it. We trust that this is so. If for some reason it seems to be violated, we ask, I mean, if you were to disappear in some moment, you would say, how, oh, what a beautiful trick. This is not an act of magic. That means there is a procedure through which this man one appears to disappear. And we try to recover the structural coherences of the circumstances in which we are, this we do unconsciously. And this is what we enjoy when we go to a performance of a magician. We want to be cheated, to believe that something is happening that we know will not be happening as it appears to be happening. And uh, we live in this consciously and unconsciously. And we trust that it is occurring in all what we do. We are biologists, physicists, quantum physicists, whatever. Uh, the fact that uh, we can make uh, probability computations is rest on the trust that things are not haphazard and they uh, occur according to certain coherences of the domain in which they occur. Fundamental inertia, well, I call it fundamental inertia, which is our trust in that things will go on being whatever they are being, uh, unless something happens. You can speak about uh, Galileo and Newton about inertia, but I'm calling it fundamental because it's not a special situation. This is the fundament of all what we do. We trust fundamental inertia. We trust that if we leave, Something on the table will be there, and if it's not there when we go for it, we ask who took it, or something like that. So this is a fundamental trust, which I call fundamental inertia. And this at the same time, structural determinism, the fundamental trust. What is the trick when something happens differently? from what should happen according to the coherences of the circumstance. Mm -hmm. So we are consciously and unconscious trusting this fundamental inertia in whatever we do. The other thing is that we live, we living beings, and this is valid for all living beings, we live as valid whatever we live in the moment that we live it. If we see something there, we live at one. We saw something there. So the other person may say, I see nothing, well, but I saw it. If I have an illusion, I leave the illusion. And the illusion does not appear as an illusion until afterwards when I say it was an illusion because now I claim that with that what I saw then was not valid because I think that it's valid this other situation. Hmm? We, human beings, all living beings live as valid whatever they live in the moment that they live it. And we want to explain our doings. We like to do so. And the question that we make, I left uh, such and such a thing on the table. Who, did, who took it? 
I took it mala. This is the explanation of how it disappeared. The process which results in the, the thing that I left there is not there anymore. This is what an explanation is. It's the proposition of a process that if it were to take place, the result would be that which we want to explain. We find that we have to explain our language. And this is interesting thing. If we are not in language, we do not, we do not explain. We do not need explanations. I mean, living systems do not, do not need explanations or theories to live. We do not need explanations or theories to live. But we like to explain. We enjoy explaining. And when one accepts an explanation, their life goes according to what the explanation says. If we, we do not need theories, we enjoy making theories. <laughs> if we make a theory and we accept the theory that we make, our life goes following the theory because we live as valid whatever we leave, whatever we accept in the moment that we leave it and we accept it. But we have to explain language. And why we speak about language? Nouns obscure the verbs that constitute them. And if I say language, it appears as an entity. But language does not occur as an entity. It's a dynamic. It's a process. It's occurring with the flow of occurring. Language is... If it's not flowing, language is not. No? And so, we want to, to understand what language is, and as we live in language, we live in conversation. This is a conversation between all of us, in the sense that we are talking, listening to talking, and feeling what we feel as we listen to talking, and changing our feelings and emotions as we go on listening and talking. And we do all what we do in networks of conversations. In networks of coordinations, of coordinations of doings, and emotions and feelings. When we study a profession, we study a network of conversations. And that goes with our whole bodyhood. We, we look at a person and if we are perceptive, we say, but this person is an engineer, scientist, uh, a poet, the way they live and move, and they talk, they deal symbolic, what they, they do, are uh, networks of conversation that we can recognize. Coordinations of coordinations of feelings, emotions, and doings. And as I said, language occurs as language as a living together in a flow of recursive coordinations of feelings, doings, and emotions. Recursive coordination. Yesterday, we talk about recursion and reflection. Life is a recursive process in that sense. History is a recursive dynamics. Every moment, occurs on top of the consequences of the previous moment. That is what a recursion is. A recursion is a cyclical dynamic associated with the linear dynamics, so that each repetition of the dynamic, cyclical dynamic steps on the results of its previous, previous operation. And whenever there is recursion, something new appears. Completely new, could not have been predicted before. If I make these movements, you can say that I'm imitating walking, and I, even I can say I mimic it. But it's not walking. Walking will appear in this process. In the association of the cyclic movement of my legs and the linear displacement of the floor. And you cannot deduce the consequences of a recursive dynamic before the recursive dynamic occurs. Afterwards, you can say, oh, of course, how beautiful. But you see, 
It is not true there are, that there is nothing new under the sun. All the time, <laughs> there are new things that are appearing in perfect and recursive situations. And when we speak of conversation, we we'll tend to the inner feelings and emotions that guide the recursiveness of language. was an interesting conversation. It was a painful conversation. Our emotions change along this. And so it's the emotion, the, the, the feelings that go with the flow of coordination of <coughs> doings that give the character to the conversation. Now, as we observe the beings, when they operate as totalities, the living beings operate as totalities. Yes, all of us are made of molecules and are made of cells, and cells are little living beings, but in this not conglomerate, this assembling of all these cells interconnected with each other in a multi-systemic manner, as Jimena likes to say, in a systemic, systemic, systemic manner, multiple dimension, a totality is constituted. And the totality exists in interaction with the medium, in the niche. Now, this is interesting. The niche does not exist by itself. And we biologists have had many discussions about whether there are new niches, open niches, for new possibilities. Yes, but that is our fantasy. The niche arises together with the organism. The organism disappears, the niche disappears. And the organism could be a bacterium, a cell, a conglomerate of cells, and a magnificent totality as a mammal. And the interesting thing is that they are integrated, that, that the organism integrates a niche and constitutes a unity with the niche. And we call this uh, unity, the organismic unity. Now, the organismic unity, they are not independent from each other. We can distinguish them because they are processes that separate them in the cleavage, but they are interconnected in the flow of molecules and energy if you wish to, to pick, speak to. And there is a totality. And the history of the living system, indeed, is the history of the conservation of different organism niche unities and transformations of the manner of realization of the living of the organism in a continually changing organism niche unity. Now, it turns out that you are part of my niche today. And I am, and we are part of your niche. And maybe the later on we shall not be, but the memory could be. So, so the niche, look, it's, it's not an entity, it's a dynamic, but at the same time, it's something that you can distinguish. Because it arises with the operation of the organism. The observer, any one of us, a multi-sensorial observer, and this I insist on this because he may assure me one day that this is a, a restricted drawing. Because it is as if we are observing only the eyes, but it's with all our sensoriality. Because all our sensoriality is involved in operation in our niche, and this distinction that this observer makes of the organism and its behavior is occurring in the niche of the observer. <coughs> Not outside it. This, this is the dynamic because, and we shall say a little bit about the nervous system, and the nervous system in its operation is operating in the internal dynamics of the organism. And whatever it happens in the internal dynamics of the organism results in the interaction with the niche. And so, the organism niche unity is the transformation and either it is conserved 
in the flow of transformation or disappears. Now the word transformation is a very beautiful one because transformation entails conservation. Something remains invariant. And as the living system lives, what remains invariant is living. But living occurs in the niche that makes it possible. Hmm? Mass organisms in their interactions change together here. There are two arms missing between A and B. But this whole thing is occurring as a not as a totality. Our problem with, with the words is that uh, we use nouns, and as we use nouns, we have entities. Because the whole thing is occurring in different manners of being totalities. As A and B interact and interact recursively, transform together, and the totality that is being, and we have a word for that, for example, couple. But A and B conserve their respective identities as autopoietic molecular, autopoietic beings, if they are living systems in this case, but they transform the manner of being together to transform the structure around the conservation of the organization and the relation to the niche, which in this case, each one is part of the niche of the other, and the circumstance indicated as C. Like, the C indicates this, whatever, whatever else is there. But this does not mean that A and B are fuzzy. They are perfectly well defined and contained in realized as molecular autopoietic systems. They are specifying their own borders. Here we specify as autopoietic, molecular autopoietic system, our own borders, but at the same time we interact and we trigger each other changes which hopefully do not result in our disintegration because our organization is conserved and we remain together, transforming together, somehow, in a history of transformation. And we can distinguish several domains of interactions and domains of existence, domain of existence, domains of existence, and so each entity exists in many dimensions, according to its characteristics. As an entity, living system exists in the domain of relations, in the domain of feelings, in the domain of emotions, and we in the domain of language, in addition to that. Organism and medium came together in a concrete manner. This happens in the we don't have to do it, it's happening all the time. And the only thing that jump changes is the path followed by this continuous changing together of the organism and the circumstances. And the organism and the stage constitute an operational, relational unity. The organism is unity both in its individual living and in the flow of evolution. As we have been thinking in the organism alone, we have been looking at the evolution of living being as the evolution of organism. Now I'm inviting you to realize that the evolution is not the evolution of organism, it's the evolution of organism in each unities. And what changes when different lineages are established is the manner of realizing that organism needs unity. The organism cannot be outside its niche, nor there is a niche without the organism that generates it. And uh, of course this has been known. There is a wonderful book by Anderson, I think it is, which is called The Fitness of the Medium. 
but it's the fact that, that the medium has to be adequate for the organism, and that is the niche. If not, the organism doesn't live. But this, and this is the beauty of the whole history of uh, the biosphere transformation of these coherent entities in this gigantic thing that the biosphere is, or the ecological situation of particular kind, but they are all the result of this continuous transformation of the organism in the unity and the generation of new manners of doing the realization of living in this conservation of manners of living. And we are emotional beings that use our rationality to validate or invalidate our emotions. Now, we live at the present of a history that had, has depreciated emotion. Oh, that is emotional, be rational. That is emotional, be rational. But even every rational system has foundation in basic premises that are accepted not rationally, but according to preferences. Why to accept A, B, C as foundational premises for something? Oh, because uh, I like it. It's good. I think it's, it's fundamental. Well, my reasons are, and which are the fundamentals of my reason? Again, something that I choose out of my desires and preferences. Emotion, desires, and preferences are the fundamentals of everything that we do. And this is not a limitation, it's our condition of constitution. It doesn't mean that reason is not a fundamental thing, it is. But it's a, rationality is always a construction on certain basic premises. And what basic premises? And sometimes we fight each other, calling each other not rational, and we do not look to the basic premises of which we are all rational beings. I mean, this has a theory with these premises and it's completely rational. And this other has another theory with different premises and it's completely rational. And they accuse each other of not being rational because they do not look at the premises and the differences. It's in the premises, not in the construction that they make, logical constructions that they make starting from them. Now, the nervous system. When I was a student, of course, the nervous system was an organ of perception, an organ to capture the features of the, of the medium. I remember I wrote in 1964, I think I might have been about 36 years old, an article answering a request made for some from, by some students in the medical school where I was teaching, Santiago, who asked me, please, Professor Madurana, write something about the social role of science. Okay, I can do that. And I wrote an article, which is still there somewhere in some library, it says to do science, you have to accept two fundamental premises. One, that there is reality independent from you. And two, that this reality can be known directly or indirectly by some means that we develop. A year later, I was thinking completely different. I realized that science has nothing to do with reality, but has to do with the coherences of our living. The nervous system operates distinguishing configuration. Now, this, this matter of distinguishing configuration is a very interesting thing, because We do not realize 
that we do that because we are in the idea that we generalize from the particular. We distinguish certain particular things and then we generalize. But that is not the case. We distinguish configuration and the particulars are intersections of configurations. The nervous system operates that, that way, the neuron. The eye does not respond to particular things, but to the configuration that triggers in it a response. The placebo is a substance that for the organism operates exactly as some other substance because it triggers the same processes because they share a particular configuration. They may have many difference, but share a particular configuration. A receptor in a cell, in the surface of the cell, is a molecule that captures, for example, hormones. What captures is a configuration. It's a molecular configuration that fits its characteristic as a receptor. Whatever else this molecule has is relevant for that. If it, if it has the configuration that fits the receptor, then there it is, and triggers whatever it triggers. The key that opens the lock, the lock doesn't care about the handle that is handling the key. The key must satisfy a certain configuration, and many hands different, many shapes of keys Many things different may satisfy the same configuration and open the same lock. Well, but this is uh, the manner the nervous system operates. And this is a very interesting thing, and this is not a supposition. We can show this configurations and relations of activity between within itself. And this is what the nervous system does. The nervous system operates as a closed network of changing relations of activities in itself. It has one peculiarity though, which is intersects with some elements of the organism at the sensory and effective surfaces of the organism. But when the organism interacts, it's the organism that interacts not the nervous system. The nervous system does not interact with the medium, <coughs> operates generating these internal correlations, and avoids <coughs> internal correlations, generating internal correlations that result in sensory effect correlations in the organism. Hmm? It operates in this way. Moreover, the nervous system operates generating sensory effective relations in the organism, which I have just said, in its speech. So this internal dynamic of the nervous system has consequences in the dynamic of the organism, yes. But when the organism interacts, the need doesn't tell the organism what it is, the need doesn't tell the organism what it is, it triggers in the organism responses which are internal dynamics in its own operation as a totality. And now I'm leaving with a non-distinguishing experience between perception and illusion. We never know when we commit a mistake, we will never know when we are having an illusion, because the illusion is not the happening, it's the reflection on the happening. I see a friend, John, how wonderful to see you. Excuse me, it was not John, it was an illusion. The illusion appears in the moment in which one makes a reflection comparing another experience, I mean one experience with another. If the second experience I accept as valid, but if I accept it as valid, invalidates the first, I say that the first was an illusion. 
or was a mistake. Mistakes are not in themselves. Illusions are not in themselves. They arise as affection in the comparison of experiences. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Fantastic. Listen, this when we see this hole on the ground with water and the boat in it, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, that is a photography not of a hole on the ground but of a painting, which is a magnificently done, such that if you look at it, look at the piece, looking, what, what a funny thing huh? that fell over there. Looks about that. Because this one is new. We do not know what we are living an illusion or doing a mistake. In a lie, we know that we are lying. But if we knew that we were committing a mistake, then we would not do it. <laughs> or we would lie. We are according to what we accept as valid in what we see, feel, think, or imagine. What do we know then? What we, what we see or do, now, what we see or do, what we see or what we do, what do we know? Is, is seeing or doing knowing? What do we... What would we do? We explain the operational coherences of our living with the operational coherences of our living. Have you realized? This is what science does. We do not explain what we do with reference. We speak about the reference to something else, but indeed what we are doing is operating in the coherences of our doings, in the domain of realization of our beliefs. We do not distinguish an experience between perception and illusion, and this is not a mistake, it's not a failure, it's not an insufficiency, it's a condition of our existence, all living systems are like that, and you have been like that since you were born. And I also. We call laws of nature, what we call laws of nature, are abstractions of the operational relation of coherences of the realization of our living. Look, look, look to what we do as scientists. This is what we do. The law of gravity arises in that way. This, this um, apocryphal history of Newton receiving the apple of the head and inventing the law of gravity <coughs> is telling something, not pure something, because we can imagine Newton taking the apple and throw it away. And the apple went not right there. And then threw it with more effort, went farther away. And went with more effort and farther away and he realized that the apple was making the same curve in every case. Moved exactly in the same manner in every case, although differently because the effort that he made. And then reflecting on that, of course, and many more other things, then he abstracts the law of gravity, which is a law that refers to the coherences of happenings with what we do when we observe or do certain things. But we observe and do things in the realization of our living as molecular of the biotic system, nearly coming out of us. The basic law of nature, whenever in a collection of elements some configuration of relations begins to be conserved, the space is open for all else to change around the relations that are conserved. We use this 
Because it is a fundamental thing. And this is an abstraction. I mean, it's not a definition, it's not a proposition. You can look it in your life. Pay attention to what you can observe and you will see what can change. The most important thing in change is what is concerned. What is to know? Knowledge is that which we ascribe to another person that could be ourselves when we see that she behaves in a manner that we consider adequate in the domain in which we observe her. If you are teachers, this is what you do. If you are scientists listening to another scientist, this is what you listen. When the other person does things in a way that you consider adequate according to your thinking of how that should be, you say, ah, he knows, she knows. Does not, does not agree with you, you say, no, doesn't know. But being in this way, we human beings, and put myself there, be, we human beings have generated I mean, it's fantastic. All the wonderful things that we have done, gone to the moon, trying to find the God's particle, quantum mechanics, whatever it is, biology, medicine, genetics, buildings. But this is how we act. How do you know? How do you do it? No, it doesn't. It's, it's not done in that way. You know nothing. If it's not done in this way, is it doing? This is why we have changed the question from being to doing. It's not what is, but what we do. And what did Einstein do? Follow the consequences of the doing, and look at the doings that would constitute the fundament for other doings. Is his reflection? And I mention Einstein because. Uh, I later I realized that he was doing the same thing I was doing. I mean, of course, I am later older than Einstein. <laughs> Reality is an imaginary notion that we use. Imaginary, imaginary notion that we use to give a transcendental explanation to the coherences of our need. We do not need reality. And whenever we resort to reality, we're inventing something. And the whole history of questions about reality and not reality has to do with the fact that we cannot claim anything about something independent of what we do. Yes according to what I have said so far. We do not construct reality either. This is why I say that I am not a constructivist. But the planet is an explanatory invention. But what we do in the realization of our living as molecular autobiotic systems in the organist nature unity that we integrate is reality. We are reality. Now you may notice that uh, there are realities with capital R and here realities with not capital R. <coughs> because it's not it's not a supposition of, of something external. It's what we do. We explain our living with what we do. We create whatever we create with the coherence of what we do. We follow the path of whatever we accept as valid, whatever it is. I may, you may be thinking that this is a fantasy, yet here I am, following the path of the consequences of what I think and telling this to you. And if it comes a physicist, the quantum physics is, will present something else according to the consequences of what he thinks are valid. 
And the world will change in every case according to what we do. If I am a quantum physicist and follow what I think that is the coherence of the doings proper to quantum physics, the world becomes in one way. But not as a fantasy, as domain of coherences, as a matrix of possible operations. And we can make deductions there. And why we can make deductions there? Because the founding premises are the coherences of what we do. Four basic not premises, conditions of existence. Hmm? We human beings are the origin of everything. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to I mean, or see, oh, see, that is fantastic. <laughs> Nothing exists by itself. Something exists as it arises with what we do as we distinguish it. Fundamental relativity. We are the source of everything. Thank you very much.